The 3D models in this video were made by Kuzim, or Adam Midzuk, and the animations were made by Tyler Addison. Their socials will be included in the description and the comment section below. Tyrannosaurus is the most iconic fossil animal known to mankind. Aside from the Tyrant Lizard King and its mostly irrelevant species names, only a few other fossil animals have risen to similar but still less lofty heights. Obviously, there are the other famous dinosaur archetypes, Triceratops, Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus, Raptor, Ankylosaurus, and Parasaurolophus. However, there are some non-dinosaurs that have also reached these levels. The Mammoth, Smilodon, Giant Ground Sloth, Hell Pigs, Terror Birds, and of course, the Mighty Megalodon. Megalodon is the most iconic extinct fish and may have even rivaled the Tyrant Lizard in size, but definitely in weight. The size of this immense beast has been the subject of dozens of papers over the years and many discussions mostly due to its fossil record containing only teeth with some minor vertebrae and bits of jaws, thanks to the beast's skeleton being composed entirely of cartilage rather than bone. In past videos when I have referred to the genus name of Megalodon, I've called it Carcaracles. However, the genus of Megalodon, which is just the species name, has also changed over the years from Carcaracles to Procarcaridon, Megasalachus to Carcaridon, and finally to the currently agreed upon Otodus. This is to avoid direct linkage between these giant, whale-sized megatooth sharks from currently living shark groups as Megalodon shows many distinct characteristics. In March of 2022, a paper authored by Kenshu Shimada, Harry Maishk IV, Victor Perez, Martin Becker, and Michael Griffiths, and published by Historical Biology, an international journal of paleobiology, reanalyzed the data of previous studies, estimating megalodon total lengths based on 544 tooth specimens, some of which came from a hypothesized megalodon nursery. This new paper also reports and discusses a megalodon body size pattern they observed across different fossil populations which has yet to be reported. This new paper is based on the work done by another group of researchers, namely Jose Jarez, Joan Ribé, Hector Potela, Carlos Martinez Perez, and Humberto Farron. Their 2020 study described a then-new fossil locality dating from the Miocene Epoch and located in northeastern Spain, plus eight then-previously known sites in eight other formations that were used in their 2015 paper. The new locality they described was hypothesized to be a megalodon nursery, as the majority of tooth fossils from the locality were small and the locality was once part of the coastal environment, whereas most megalodon teeth come from deeper sediments. In this 2020 study, the researchers estimated the body lengths of these young megalodons from the massive number of teeth specimens, plus a linear regression equation created based on the relationship between tooth crown height and body length in living great white sharks. Despite the fact that Megalodon and the Great White are only distantly related, this was the best way to estimate the lengths of Megalodon at the time. The new 2022 study found that the specimens the 2020 study were using were teeth that don't reliably show a relationship to the body's length. Turns out that only the teeth from the first third of the upper jaws are reliably related to body length, making a large number of the specimens used in the 2020 study unreliable. The new team threw them out of the dataset. Kenshu Shimada and company threw out any tooth specimens that were not directly from the nine localities or populations examined in the 2015 and 2020 studies, and all that could not be identified as teeth from the front of the upper jaws. Those nine megalodon assemblages include Temblor Formation, a fossil assemblage in Southern California that provides 11 good specimens, Calvert Formation, a fossil assemblage in Maryland that provides eight specimens. Langian outcrop, a fossil assemblage in northeastern Spain that provides a good four specimens. Pisco formation, a fossil assemblage in Peru that provides 11. Gatun formation, a fossil assemblage in Panama with six good specimens. 
Chacunaque Formation in Panama with about 11 specimens. Bahia Inglesa Formation, a fossil assemblage in Chile that used to be called the Juara Formation with 16 specimens. Yorktown Formation from North Carolina with 4 specimens. And Bone Valley Formation, a fossil assemblage in Florida, which is technically the Bone Valley member of the Peace River Formation with 9 specimens. Each of these assemblages all have what the authors call excellent stratigraphic control. That means that there is a strong degree of understanding of the stratigraphy or layers of rock and their ages of the assemblages. Broken down further, this means the rock layers for each of these fossil assemblages is strong and without much controversy or gray lines. That makes it easier to understand where each of the specimens places on a geologic timeline and evolutionary context. The only stick in the mud here is the Bone Valley assemblage, as the fossils may be late Miocene in age, but Shimada and crew work under the assumption that it is of Pliocene age as it was originally interpreted by the 2015 and 2020 studies. For the purpose of this new study, Shimada and friends organized the assemblages by age and correlating to specific climatic shifts. The Mid-Miocene, representing the peak of the Mid-Miocene climatic optimum, the hot period. Late Miocene representing a period of declining global temperatures, the warm period. And Early Pliocene, representing a period of further global temperature drops, the cool period. The team's first order of business was to see if the trends found by the earlier groups from the 2015 and 2020 studies remained intact with the new, smaller, more reliable dataset. They used the equations based on the great white as well as the one based on the summed tooth crown width. This latter equation results in two body length estimates per tooth, one length that uses data from the largest specimen and one from the smallest. The second order of business was to observe any patterns in body size trends given the new, smaller, more reliable dataset. The 2015 study by Catalina Pimiento and Megan Bulk examined the possible megalodon body size trends across hemispheres, ocean basins, latitudes, and time. Shimada and team's new study translated latitudinal data into sea surface temperature data. This gives a rough estimate as to the temperature of the oceans at the different latitudes. The author team decided to do this with the data because the different megalodon localities span the different temperature changes throughout the Miocene and early Pliocene. Climatic differences between populations of megalodon may have some factor in comparisons between them. Mid-Miocene Bin the localities that fit into the Mid-Miocene time and climate bin were the Templar and Calvert formations and the Langian outcrop. Using the older body length equation, the team estimated the mean megalodon body lengths from these three sites as 10, 5, and 4 meters respectively. Using the other method of size estimation with the largest individual, they got 16, 9, and 5 meters, while the other method, using the smallest individual, got them 14.8, 8.5, and 5 meters. Late Miocene Bin Those formations that fit within the Late Miocene climate and time frame are the Pisco, Gatun, Chacunake, and Bahia Inglesa formations. All of these sites are geographically located along the west coast of Central and South America. For this grouping, using the older equation, the team got mean lengths of 10.7, 5, 7, and 11.7 meters respectively. New equation based on largest boy got 15, 7.6, 10, and 17.8 meters, while the new equation based on smallest boy got 14, 7, 9, and 16.6 meters. Early Pliocene Bin Finally, the third climate and time bin consisted of the Yorktown and Bone Valley site. These two occur along the Atlantic coast of the Northern Hemisphere. Old equation got 10 and 5 meters respectively. New equation for largest fish got 15.5 and 8.5, while new equation for smallest fish got 14.3 and 7.8 meters. Bergman's Rule and the Meg 
Bergman's Rule, named after 19th century German biologist Karl Bergman, who was the first to describe the pattern, is a general eco-geographical rule which boils down to animals get bigger in cold places or during cold times, and vice versa. This was thought due to larger animals retaining a smaller surface to volume ratio so they can retain heat better at larger sizes during cold times. It's now regarded as a valid generalization with some exceptions, which is now more often used in the context of populations rather than species or genera. Bergman's rule is also most often applied to terrestrial mammals. Some non-mammals and non-landlubbers have been analyzed under the parameters of Bergman's rule, like fish, amphibians, reptiles, and such. It should be noted that this rule is not in relation to latitude or the horizontal ranges across the planet. Instead, the rule applies more to the ecologies of these latitudes. It's not the temperature that is controlling the size of the animals. The temperature is controlling the natural resources of regions or latitudes that then control the size of the animals in those regions. Bergman's rule has never been used to explain the sizes of living cartilaginous fish, yet latitude body size gradients for these types of fish exist for some species. The authors made sure to caveat that this lack of modern data shouldn't be seen as a knock against their hypothesis, data, or conclusion, as there are no modern analogs to the megatooth sharks in today's oceans anyway. Therefore, this study may represent the first demonstration of Bergman's rule in cartilage skeletoned weirdos. The giant sizes of megalodon are generally considered a result of the evolution of gigantothermy wherein giant animals have a warm-blooded high metabolism just because they are big. Existing at that size and moving around produces enough heat to keep their insides at a constant temperature. This sort of thing has been observed in many modern large sharks. Another factor to the gigantism of the megalodons is this new Bergman's rule thing. There's a trend in body size across populations and times. The higher latitude the megalodon, the larger they seem to be. Many modern marine mammals show a similar trend, so it fits that Megalodon would also bend to this rule. There were some chunks of data that disagreed with this Bergman's rule over time thing for Megalodon sizes. The mid-Miocene bin formations are at similar latitudes but do not show the trend of large sharks in high latitudes and small sharks in low latitudes. This is probably because each formation within the mid-Miocene bin is drastically different from one another. They all come from different ocean basins of different oceanic conditions. For example, the Tembalor Formation is the only locality that got hit by a perpendicular oceanic current. This current would have brought huge amounts of nutrients up to this region, which may have allowed for larger overall meg sizes than other localities. The Paleo Nursery site of the Lengian outcrop in Spain is another example of an exception to the rule. The megalodons here are very small, 4.3 meters in size, despite the fact that these were colder waters. There is a possibility that these were dwarf megalodons that were affected by insular dwarfism, as the Mediterranean had only recently connected to the Atlantic at that time, thus having an enclosed environment. The authors do point out that this is a very shaky idea since the sample size of 25 teeth is rather small. The authors conclude that the fact that large and small-bodied megalodon assemblages are found in all three time and climate bins suggests that the size distribution of megalodon remained consistent through time. They kept the gradient of large size in cold water and small size in warm water throughout their evolution. The author team made note that their study might seem to refute the existence of paleo nurseries that were hypothesized by past researchers. Shimada and team note that they don't think their study fully does this, as it is still plausible that the assemblages close to the equator could have been paleo nurseries for the absolutely enormous yet no less adorable megalodon pups. A migration hypothesis is proposed to explain size differences associated with these proposed paleo nurseries. That young small megalodons remained in warmer shallower regions, nurseries, before migrating to higher latitudes and colder seas as they grew. This hypothesis isn't refuted by most of the evidence, but there are some assemblages that contain mostly smaller-sized megalodons that were located at higher latitudes and colder climates. 
In other words, the author team found their data to lessen the validity of the nursery hypothesis, but not to such a point that it should be thrown out altogether. Nurseries tend to benefit species with small babies, but megalodons were born at a full 2 meters 6 and a half feet, which doesn't totally fit. So this study didn't really reveal anything groundbreaking about prehistory's largest shark, but it adds to the understanding of their ecology and why their fossil record looks the way it does. It was found that megalodons were bigger in colder climates, so I'd hate to be an arctic explorer at the time. You'd be wanting to stay where it was warmest if you ever needed to go into the ocean. It would be awesome if a more complete fossil of these guys was found someday. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Ray, Isaiah Garza, Dinosaur, Christoph Hubinger, Biotaverse, and Arda Bayer. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, The Dogman, Iron Bladesman, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.